Okay, so uh, the next study that we're going to look at is um, Sperry. Now, Sperry is um, looking at uh, the features of your brain. Okay, so he's looking at something called hemispheric deconnection. So uh, it's otherwise known as Sperry's split brain study. So he's looking at participants who have essentially had their brain uh, cut in half, basically. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit more about why that's happened and what the effects of that are, because that's what he studies, the effects of that hemispheric deconnection. OK, uh, but first a bit about the brain and the, and the hemispheres of the brain. OK, so you never refer to um, your brain as being in halves. So your brain is in halves. Um, so you can see in like these um, diagrams here, so they're kind of in halves there, half there, half there. And I've seen this sort of cartoony one, it's in halves. So you never call them the left half and the right half. Instead, we call them hemispheres. OK, so um, the hemispheres of the brain, um, we often hear people talk about the different um, features or abilities of each hemisphere. So we often hear that the left is uh, to do with logic. So people often say that the left hemisphere is to do with language, with um, writing, logic, reason, maths, science, um, writing, scientific skills, um, things like that. And people often say that uh, the right hemisphere is to do with more creative pursuits so things like pictures symbols um art imagination having insight music spatial awareness emotions symbols things like that um now we also know that the the brain and the body are contralateral so that means that one side of your body is controlled by the opposite hemisphere. So your left hemisphere here um, controls your right hand and processes information from your um, right visual field. Okay, so this is your, your right eye there and your right visual field is everything to the right side of your nose. So it's processing information from the right side of your body. So right hand, right visual field. Whereas your right hemisphere processes whoops, information from the left side of the body. So the left visual field controls the left hand. Okay, so that's worth remembering. So your brain and your body, contralateral. So left hemisphere controls the right side, right hemisphere controls the left side. Now, a lot of this, so the left of the brain is creative uh, is logical sorry in the right hemisphere is um creative it's very sort of pop psychology or what we'd call pop psychology so it's really not as simplistic as that that one hemisphere is creative and one is logical however we do know that specific parts of the brain are in control of specific functions OK, so that is what we're going to look at. So the first um, thing that we're going to look at is what you call lateralisation of functioning. So lateralisation of functioning is kind of a more scientific thing of what we just did, saying this is in the left hemisphere and this is in the right hemisphere. But first of all, we need to know what the brain looks like. OK, so on the right, uh, uh, on this slide, rather, you've got a couple of kind of like drawings and pictures of, of what the brain looks like. So obviously you've got a drawing here on the right and you've got a picture here on the left. So there's your left hemisphere, there's your right hemisphere. Now what you've got there in between is called your corpus callosum. So your corpus callosum connects the two hemispheres and it is responsible for communication between those two hemispheres 
Okay, so we need to know where that is and what that looks like. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about why later on. But you've got your left hemisphere, your right hemisphere, and they're held together by this bunch of fibres called your corpus callosum. And they pass information between the two hemispheres. That's its function. Passes those hemispheres um, communications to one another. OK, so its function isn't just to hold the brain together. Obviously, it does, but it passes that information between the two. OK. Now, in terms of lateralization of functioning, we can't just say that the left hemisphere is logical and the right is creative. But we do know that some logic functions do occur in that left hemisphere. OK, so. We can say that language is a lateralized function. So lateralization of brain function refers to how some neural functions or cognitive processes. So whenever you see the word cognitive, you're thinking about thought processes. So how some functions and some processes tend to be more dominant in one hemisphere than the other. OK, but we're looking at it in a more scientific way than just left brain, right brain. OK, um, so for example, we know that there's two areas in your left hemisphere which are to do with language production and language comprehension, and they're only in your left hemisphere. Now, they're called Broca's area and Wernicke's area. OK, so you can see them there on the brain. So this is the left hemisphere. So you've got Broca's area there and Wernicke's area there. OK, so... We can say that language is lateralized because we know that there's definitely in the left hemisphere those language areas. OK, so it's more dominant in the left hemisphere. So you've got two main language centers in that left hemisphere. So we'll say Broca's area. Now that's to do with language production and Wernicke's area. And that's to do with language comprehension. OK, so if you have damage to either of these areas, it can affect a person's language ability and it can lead to something called aphasia. So if you have aphasia, it means that you're struggling to use that speech function. So if we have Broca's aphasia, so it might be that we've had some kind of brain damage. Uh, we might have had like a, a virus that's affected this part of the brain or um, a traumatic head injury, um, but it's just affected this part here. So in Broca's aphasia, because it's to do with producing language, it might be that people know what they want to say, but they just can't say it. They can't get those words out. OK. Um, now, it also means that patients will understand what you're saying to them. So I can understand what you say to me, but I can't speak fluently. OK, um, now there's famous cases of this, um, things like um, somebody called uh, Tan, um, and he's called Tan because Tan was one of the very few words that he could say, it was the most common word that he could say, so he could understand what you were saying to him, but all he could say in response was Tan. OK, so he couldn't produce language that, that makes any sense or speak fluently. Um, and if you've got Wernicke's area, it might mean that you uh, struggle with language comprehension. OK, so I can't understand what you're saying to me. And I also cannot make speech that makes sense. OK. So your corpus callosum, uh, as I said, is uh, this wide, flat bundle of neural fibres or nerve fiber, fibers, and that connects the two hemispheres together and it allows the two hemispheres, the left and the right, to communicate with each other. So anything that happens in that left hemisphere can be passed to the right hemisphere through the corpus callosum and vice versa. Okay, so we've got a couple of terms when it comes to functions of the brain. So we've got lateralization of function. So that's saying that something is more dominant in one hemisphere. So language is more dominant in the left hemisphere. And then we've also got localization of function. The so localization of function is saying this specific area is related to this function. So Broca's area is to do with language production, and Wernicke's area is to do with language comprehension, and the corpus callosum is to do with communicating information. Okay, so that's localization of function.
Okay. So we know in terms of um, finding out the functions um, and localization and lateralization, this is more lateralization rather than localization. Uh, the right hemisphere is controlling the left hand, processes information from the left hand, whereas the left hemisphere processes information from the right hand um, and controls the right hand. Okay, and visual information, like I said, also crosses over. So in this diagram, uh, that person is uh, looking at uh, like a chicken foot and that's being processed even though it's in this visual field your right visual field is being processed in the left hemisphere and this one's looking at like a house and a car and a snowman and that information will be processed in the right hemisphere even though it's in the left visual field okay so in terms of understanding visual pathways in the brain, so I never want to hear the words your left eye, your right eye, okay? Your, each eye can still see things in the other visual field, okay? So your left visual field is everything to the left of your nose and your right visual field is everything to the right of your nose. Okay, so these are the words that we want to hear. Left visual field, right visual field. Now, you can't just say I because if, for example, and do this with me now, I want you to put your hand over your left eye, to put your right hand over your left eye. Okay, so now I am only using my right eye. Okay, now I want you to put your finger by your left ear and start moving it over, okay? And then stop when you can see it. So if, for me, my finger is still to the left of my nose, okay? And yours probably will be as well. Your finger's still to the left of your nose. Now, I can see that with my right eye. All right, so that just kind of demonstrates then I can see into both visual fields. So I can still see things in my left visual field with my right eye, and I can still see things in my right visual field with my left eye, which is why you need to say visual field and not eyes, okay? And that's demonstrated in this diagram here. So left visual field, but I can still see it with my right eye. Right visual field can still see it with my left eye, okay? All right, so we'll learn more about this um, in your second year, your visual system. But all you really need to know for now is that you've got information in your left and your right visual field um, beyond the retina, which is in your eye. This information is passed down your optic nerves, which are here, and it crosses over into the opposite hemisphere. Most of that information crosses over into the opposite hemisphere in your optic chiasm. So then it ends up being processed by the opposite hemisphere. Okay. So information presented to the right visual field is processed in the left hemisphere. And to the left visual field is processed in your right hemisphere. Okay. So. In um, in this study, uh, Sperry used participants who all had uh, epilepsy. Okay, so uh, epilepsy. Oops, come on. There we go. Um, is um, a tendency to have um, recurrent seizures. So I'm just going to play this short little video about epilepsy and I want you to make some notes on it in the background information for this study. <laughs> 
Okay, so you can learn more about epilepsy on there. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about what it is. So that's kind of some of the things that can cause it um, and things that can treat it. But what it is, basically, is, as I say, this tendency to have recurrent seizures, which are sometimes incorrectly really called fits. They're called seizures, okay? Um, so a seizure is caused by a sudden burst of excess electrical activity in the brain. So it causes a temporary disruption in normal messages passing between brain cells. So what's happening in um, the typical brain is that every time you um, do something, an electrical signal is firing, even if it's a, you know, a, 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 a thought reminding you to breathe, your heart rate changes, all of that begins as an electrical signal being passed between brain cells. And so what's happening in the, the brain of somebody with epilepsy is that they're firing too many signals at once. And these signals can become um, confused. Um, and this is what essentially causes that seizure, um, is this excess of electrical activity. So there's too much electrical activity at once. OK, so this disruption results in the brain's messages becoming halted or mixed up. OK, and then this can lead to a physical um, seizure in some way. OK, and there's different types of seizures, which I'm sure some of you probably know. OK, so. It was noticed by surgeons that if the hemispheres were separated, the seizures could be contained to one half of the brain, so to one hemisphere. So. That seizure has to originate somewhere, okay? So it will originate in either the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere, and it spreads to the whole brain in a, in a normal person. It disrupts the signals for the whole brain. Now, what they found was that they could contain these disrupted electrical signals into one hemisphere. Now, this person was still having seizures, but the severity of those seizures was massively reduced. OK, so therefore this caused less damage from the person. Now, this involves cutting that corpus callosum. So stopping your hemispheres from communicating with one another. So this is how they do it. So they would go in with their cutting device and they would just sever that corpus callosum. OK. Now, it's worth saying that this is not typically done for people with epilepsy. Um, this is only done in extreme cases. So obviously, there's other steps in treating epilepsy, things like medicines um, and homeopathic treatments and things like that. But in some people, medicine is not um, useful or practical for them. It doesn't... Um, benefit their life in any way it doesn't reduce the seizures so in an extreme extreme case where somebody is having multiple seizures a day um something like this might be done okay so uh, in some research so other studies using split brain animals have shown that there's behavioral effects um, and other research by sperry on humans and monkeys suggests though, that it's less likely to cause severe damage um, in comparison to some other brain surgeries. So other brain surgeries um, are things like frontal lobotomies. So you can see this uh, drawing here is a frontal lobotomy, uh, not really something that's done anymore. Um, obviously, we've moved into sort of some more scientific surgeries that target particular parts of the brain in particular um, functions but at, at this time when things like this were done a mental illness particularly if it was related to personality something like schizophrenia um, people um, in medical institutions would perform a frontal lobotomy which literally means going into the brain um, and getting rid of a part of it and usually it's a frontal lobotomy because it's usually done in this um frontal hemisphere here in this frontal lobe here sorry so as you can see you've got your cutting instrument you go in uh, through the eye and you just get rid of this part of the brain here 
Okay, so you target one part of the brain and remove it, or just sever it, chop it off. Okay, so um, that is incredibly harmful. Um, and so researchers suggest that things like corpus callosum, uh, corpus, um, callosum surgeries are much less harmful, less likely to cause these behavioural deficits than something like that. Okay, um, so we're going to look at um, Sperry's study and what they did now. Okay, so there's a kind of a little diagram um, which just generally shows what happened. So they're presenting information to one hemisphere or the other of somebody with a split brain. So they've had their corpus callosum cut. Okay, so the study. So um, previous studies using the split brain animals, like we say, show the behavioural effects. Uh, research by Sperry shows it's less likely to cause damage than things like frontal lobotomies. Um, and other studies show that in many ways, your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere, other than your language areas, are like mirror images of one another. Okay. Um, now, we can't ever see in a normal person exactly what the left and right hemisphere are responsible for because they are able to communicate with each other through that corpus callosum. So severing that, preventing the communication, allows us to show the true nature of the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Okay, so that's just kind of a summary of all that background information. Okay. So the aim of this study was to study the effects of hemisphere deconnection. Study the effects of hemisphere deconnection. Okay, so we're looking at lateralization of functioning. So each hemisphere has different functions. So the method, it's a uh, quasi-experiment. Quasi so uh, the patients did not have the split brain for the purpose of the experiment. So these participants had already had their split brain surgeries because of their epilepsy. Okay, um, so it makes it a quasi. The independent variable is naturally occurring as the independent variable is the split brain or not. It can also be known as a case study sometimes. So because it's a review of a small group of people and what they can and can't do. And the DV there is the performance of various tasks that are using one hemisphere or the other. Okay. Now, they tried the best in this study to control things and standardise things. Okay. So uh, things were kept the same for all participants. So the same images and words are shown to all the participants. These words are of the same level of difficulty, so they're not difficult words to identify. So there's a couple of examples there, things like key and ring. They're all shown for one tenth of a second. They're all um, given the same length of time to process that image. The same experimenter was used, so it reduces experimenter effects and researcher bias. And um, they're placing objects in their hands at another point in the study, and the same objects were used, and all again, same level of difficulty to identify. Okay, so the sample, so who's in the study? So it's 11 split brain patients with a history of advanced epilepsy that couldn't be controlled with medication. So they've all had medication, they've all tried to control their epilepsy in this way, still too severe, it's very advanced, and therefore they've had the split brain surgery. Okay, so there's a few details that we know about some of the participants. So the first one had his surgery over five and a half years before the study was conducted. Whereas the second one um, was a female housewife and a mother in her 30s. And she'd had her surgery more than four years before the study was conducted. So they've had it for quite a while. Whereas the other nine had their surgery at varying times, but not long before the study was conducted. So it could have been within the last sort of 12 months, last six months. So it's not likely you're going to be asked about the sampling method in this study because it's not stated in the original paper. But you may well be asked about the sample. So there we go. That's your sample. <laughs>
Okay, uh, there's a few examples of the tasks that were done, but I will show you those videos in the lesson. Now, the procedure. So, participants sat in front of a screen. So, this is kind of what it looks like is going on there in that bottom picture. So, they sat in front of a screen and they had hand holes to cover their hands. So, the hands went through the holes. Uh, they had an eye patch over one eye um, to ensure that visual information was being presented to one visual field at a time. Sometimes they're presenting information to both, in which case they wouldn't wear the eye patch. So, if they're only presenting information to one uh, visual field at once, they're wearing the eye patch. Okay. So they had two different types of tasks that were used. They had visual tasks um, and they had tactile tasks. So in the visual tasks, they're told to fixate on one position in the screen. So they're fixating on the middle of the screen. Okay. Now images are flashed on 35 millimeter transparencies from a standardized projector. Okay. So it's You've got your standardised projector back here, and then this is a transparent screen, so the image is flashed onto that screen for the person to view. Okay, so it's 35 millimetre transparency from a standardised projector for one tenth of a second to either the left or right visual field, while the other eye is covered to ensure that participants did not have um, time to move their eyes as if information was presented to both visual fields, it would end up being processed by both hemispheres. Okay, so that's why it's flashed so quickly and why if we're only presenting one piece of information to one hemisphere at one time, we also use the eye patch. Okay. So that's how we do the visual tasks. Yes, all of that information is relevant. Okay, so 35 millimeter, one tenth per second, why we're doing that is all relevant information. Yes, you need to know it all. So make sure it's in your notes. Okay, now in the tactile tasks, the tactile tasks are about holding things. So um, they're still fixating on one position in the screen, uh, but below the translucent screen where the gap is for their hands to reach through, where they can't see their hands, objects are placed in the participant's right or left hand or in both hands. Um, and information is processed by the opposite hemisphere, obviously. And they're also having words presented on that, that screen where they might have to select those objects. Okay. Now, the apparatus used is called a tachistocope. Okay. Now, in the results... Okay, so information is only shown and responded to in one visual field. It can only be recognised again if it's shown to the same visual field, okay? So if something is shown to my left visual field, it goes to my right hemisphere, which means it can only be recognised again if it's shown to the left visual field. So if somebody put a question mark in my left visual field, that would go to my right hemisphere. Okay, now if they put that question mark in my right visual field and said to me, is this what you saw? Well, no, because I can't recognise it because that information would then be in my left hemisphere. And there's no communication between the two again, remember. Uh, information presented to the right visual field uh, in the uh, left hemisphere is processed um, in a typical right-handed person. Uh, so it can be described in speech. Okay, if it's presented in the left hemisphere, because it's in the right visual field, it can be described in speech, because that is where my language areas are located. And I can also write it, but only with my right hand. Okay, so right visual field, right hand, left hemisphere. Uh, images shown in my left visual field could not be named. So because this is received in the right hemisphere, I've got no language in that right hemisphere, so I can't say I've seen that question mark. Now if the same information is presented to the left visual field, the participant insisted that they either did not see anything is that, or that there was only a flash of light on the left side. So because something is being presented in my left visual field and I can't describe it in speech, I can't articulate that I've seen something. So my right hemisphere knows it's seen something, but I can't say, yes, I've seen something. I'd have to say, no, there was nothing there. Okay. 
Um, now, similarly, I also couldn't write it. Now, the reason I couldn't write it is because the areas for understanding language are still in my left hemisphere. Okay, so even though I'm not using language to write in the traditional sense of speaking, I have to understand language to know that I've just seen a pen. And therefore, I can't write pen because I don't understand that what I've just seen relates to the word pen. Okay. Uh, however, they could draw the image with their left hand, as the left hand is controlled by the right hemisphere. So if I'm shown that um, question mark there, I can't write question mark, but with my right hand, I could draw a question mark. I could also point to a question mark um, with my left hand as well. Okay, so here a participant would be able to draw a question mark with their left hand as the image is processed by the right hemisphere, which controls your left hand. However, they would be able to say that they'd seen a dollar sign as this was being processed by the left hemisphere where you've got your language located. Okay, so that's your visual tasks. Now, in your tactile tasks, objects placed in the uh, right hand, therefore processed by the left hemisphere, could be described in speech or writing with the right hand again. So remember, if it's gone in the right hand, only the right hand could recognise it. Uh, if the same objects were placed in the left hand, uh, the right hemisphere will process it and participants could only make wild guesses and often seemed unaware that they were holding anything. Because again, I can't use language from that right hemisphere. So I can't articulate what's there. So uh, the participant would not be able to say what was in their left hand as this was being processed by the right hemisphere. So I couldn't at this point say that I've got a key. However, if I'm given a grab bag, so an object that's got loads of objects in, um, they would be able to search with the left hand and retrieve the item. So objects felt by one hand are recognised again only by the same hand. Okay, so if I've sent, sent something with my right hand, I couldn't retrieve it with my left hand. I could only retrieve it with my right hand. Okay. So there's an example. So I'm looking, got the word key on the left visual field. So I can pick an object, but I'm saying I didn't see anything. Okay. Now, left hand is holding a the key there. Right hand is holding a tennis ball. Okay, so the ball is being processed by my left hemisphere and the key is being processed by my right hemisphere. Now, if I'm holding these two at the same time, I can retrieve these objects by the same hands again, but each hand would act independently from the other. So say, beyond the screen of this tachistico, there's a load of objects. Um, I've held the key in my left hand and the ball in my right hand and then they've been put amongst a load of other objects my two hands would search independently so my right would be searching for the ball and it could graze over that key and not know that I'm searching for it same with the left, the left could graze over the ball and not know I'm searching for it because my left is searching for a key and my right is searching for a ball Okay. now this would actually mean that split brain patients perform this task quicker than a normal patient. So if your brain is intact, you often find that your hands end up working together. So you'd be thinking, right, I'm going to find the key and I'll find the key. All right, now I've got the key. Now I'm going to find the ball. Whereas if your two hands are working independently from one another, you're going to find the object twice as fast. Okay. Also, so say the word key is being presented to the left visual field, which is being processed by the right hemisphere, they can select this object with their left hand. Okay, and the word ring presented to the right visual field, which means um, that it's being processed in the left hemisphere, so I can say it, but also I could use my right hand to select a ring.
Okay, so how Sperry explains this is a few things to point out. So he explained that the split brain operation didn't affect the participants' intelligence or personality. Okay, but they experience, but seem to experience some short-term memory problems and limited concentration and orientation problems. Now, it's worth noting though that. People with split brains, it's not unethical to do this because they can function normally in everyday life. So in everyday life, you are experiencing the world through two visual fields, even if you have something wrong with one eye, because remember, one eye can process both visual fields. So you're always experiencing the world through two visual fields. Okay, therefore, you're always going to have that same information presented to both the right and the left hemisphere, even though those hemispheres can't communicate with one another. So the whole brain has access to all the information in your environment. Okay, so it's only evident in this study that there's these differences between the left and the right hemisphere because we're isolating the two hemispheres from one another. Okay. So Sperry concludes that both hemispheres have their own functions. Okay, so it's concluding that lateralization of functioning exists. So both hemispheres have their own functions. The left hemisphere is responsible for language and the right side of the body, whereas the right hemisphere could be more related to spatial awareness and obviously the left side of the body. Now, due to the split brain procedure, neither hemisphere can have access to information from the other when they're isolated. Okay, also people with split brains have two separate inner visual worlds, each with its own train of visual images. So split brain patients have a lack of cross integration where the second hemisphere doesn't know what the first hemisphere has been doing. Okay, and they have two independent streams of consciousness, each with its own memories, perceptions and impulses. So in other words, I've got a world for my left hemisphere and a world for my right hemisphere and my left hemisphere, when you've isolated them, as we have in this study, my left hemisphere has its own series of events and its own memories and its own impulses and it perceives one part of the world and the same for my right hemisphere. So there's no communication between the two, so they're experiencing their own versions of the world. Okay. All right, so that is the main um, part of the study. So we're just going to look at some strengths and some weaknesses and some, some criticisms of um, Sperry as well. Okay, so not all psychologists agree that this study demonstrates lateralization of functioning. So some psychologists argue that two hemispheres don't function in isolation but form a highly integrated system. So you might be able to localise functions. So we can say that Broca's area is responsible for language production, but most skills involve a bit of your left brain and a bit of your right brain in these pop psychology terms. So your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere do have independent skills, but you can't judge them as independent skills because they work together. So for example there, when you're listening to somebody speak, you might be using two hemispheres that are working together. So I'm analysing the words with the language elements in my left hemisphere, but then in my right hemisphere, I might be thinking about some of the more, um, we might say, creative elements, things like analysing nonverbal cues and intonation to get a complete picture of what a person is trying to say and how they're saying it. Okay, so they work together. You can't necessarily isolate them. Okay, so it's done in a lab setting. Um, so it's standardised, it's controlled. That means we've got more likely to, um, we're more likely to be able to say that we've got a cause and effect between two variables. It's also more likely to be reliable because if it's controlled and standardised, we can do it again, we can repeat it. It's ethical because we've not manipulated these participants in any way. Um, we've got some qualitative, in-depth information about hemispheres and the deconnection between the two and what functions we can and can't do. And also we've got some statistical analysis that can be made between um, actions that can and cannot be performed. <laughs> 
But because it's in a lab setting, you might say it's going to lack ecological validity. So it's not an everyday scenario. But also, this task lacks something called mundane realism. So mundane realism is to do with the task that you're doing and if that task is representative of real life. So normally, when you're walking around in the world, like I say, as a split brain patient, you are going to be taking in information from both visual fields. And so because what we are doing is isolating that visual field here, we might not be able to say that what we have discovered is representative of real life behaviour. So perhaps your brain is only lateralised when the hemispheres are unable to communicate with one another, not in everyday life. Perhaps they work together, like we said before. Also, the sample is small, it's unrepresentative. Um, we have to think about the different times that people had these surgeries and also the fact that they've all had epilepsy before as well. Um, so it's not a representative sample of the general population. OK, so that's Sperry study. So uh, make sure that your notes on this study are completely up to date. Um, we are going to recap the study in your next lesson where I'll be checking your notes. And also we are going to talk about the study a bit more and evaluate the study.